Uh, good evening and uh, <coughs> welcome to this uh, eighth lecture in our series. And uh, I chose uh, among the few controversies in Indian history that we will see in the course of our exploration, I chose the case of Ayodhya for several reasons. Uh, first of all, well, it is the, this region, this uh, central part of the Ganges Plains. Uh, secondly, because we, there's been so much noise about it and uh, so much confusion about it that uh, I thought I would present some objective evidence in front of you. And uh, <clears throat> it's not just the question of the de demolition of the uh, so-called Babri Masjid, but everything that preceded that is wrapped in confusion. And uh, the confusion is basically because there were several schools of scholars, two mainly. So some scholars were said to be pro-Hindu, other scholars were pro-Muslim, they were part associated with the Babri Masjid Action Committee. And <coughs> it was extremely difficult to, for the general public <coughs> excuse me, to have access to objective evidence. So I'm going to present th facts quite straightforwardly following a simple chronological approach and gathering evidence from many sources. So first of all, we have to clearly lay out what the problem was. The problem was, and this is a question which the Allahabad High Court asked and on which it published, uh, it finally released a monumental judgment uh, which is available on the internet. Was there a Hindu temple dedicated to Rama under the Babri Masjid. This was the main question that the uh, court uh, in its recent judgment tried to answer. The second question was, is there any evidence of its willful destruction? In other words, even if there was a temple, can we show that it was destroyed? Third, and this is because there were repeated denials by the historians supporting the Babri Masjid Action Committee that um, there was an ancient cult of Rama at Ayodhya. So the question is, how, what do we know about the cult to, the cult to uh, a god called Rama in India? <coughs> how ancient can we date it? What is the evidence for it? And finally, <coughs> is Rama's historicity relevant to the problem? Because the one argument constantly put forward is that in any case, Rama is not a historical figure. And uh, therefore, uh, therefore, there can be no question of, uh, you know, uh, Rama Janma Bhumi. So this is, these are the questions, you know, which we are going to fill up with. Uh, this is a map actually taken from the judgment of the, of the Allahabad High Court showing you the precise location, that little pink square, uh, shows the exact location of the disputed complex uh, over which now stands that makeshift little temple which was erected after the demolition of the mosque. And this is actually on high ground <coughs> compared to the rest of the, it kind of overlooks the, the rest of the city. And um, so we, we're going to now start our exploration, but uh, I want to make it clear that we have explored all the, in fact, this is a project for a little book uh, which I'm presenting now, where we have, uh, and uh, we includes uh, Nicole here who did much of the work of uh, searching through the evidence. We've taken archaeological evidence, epigraphic evidence, testimonies from travelers, from Islamic chronicles, from uh, <coughs> the British officials in the 19th century who gave very valuable evidence and various other sources, uh, including, of course, the early literature. But then the literature tends to be, you know, a little mythical, as, as we say. Uh, it is not, uh, plus we don't usually have dates. So, for example, when we are told that uh, Ayodhya is one of the seven ancient sacred cities of India, uh, it is good to know but then we cannot uh, draw a straightforward date from this. However, it's interesting to note that Ayodhya is equally sacred in Buddhism and Jainism. It is called Saketa, and um, for the Buddhists, they, they, there are several 
uh, Buddhist text mentioning that the Buddha stayed there for several years and preached there. Uh, for the Jains, five of the 24 Tirthankas uh, were born there, which is quite a lot, and, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, there were Buddhist as well as Jain temples in the city. And uh, interestingly, there was never any tale of a conflict uh, between, you know, those three so-called religions, which actually are, are uh, um, you, as I mentioned earlier, the borderlines were always a bit fluid between the three. Uh, they coexisted peacefully in this uh, city. It was, and this we know for certain, both in the literature as well as in the history, the capital of the Kosala uh, Mahajanapada uh, from possibly 500 or 600 BC. So the antiquity of the location is not in dispute. We, we know that Ayodhya exists as a <coughs> settlement from that time, in fact from even earlier, which I'll show you in a few minutes. But then the question is how important uh, it was in the, in the culture, in the uh, polity of, of the, the country, Th this remains to be decided. Patanjali, even earlier, because Patanjali would be 2nd or 3rd century BC, mentions Ayodhya in his commentary on, on Panini's grammar. Kalidasa also in Raghuvamsha. Of course, that is to be expected because that's the story of uh, uh, Rama's uh, lineage. So, and of course, I'm not even mentioning, quite deliberately, I'm, I'm not even mentioning Ramayana itself. But as I said, this, this does not uh, help us much to set uh, firm dates. So, what the. And, um, I'm sorry? I, did, I was not watching the screen. Oh, please let me know if it goes. Okay, there is a slightly. Okay, let's hope it stays. So, what the. Allahabad High Court did was to record testimonies from a lot of scholars um, from both sides and uh, there was a lot of cross-questioning uh, but ultimately at the end of the day <coughs> uh, though I will show you much of the uh, evidence uh, some of it extremely valuable and I would say almost conclusive from uh, historical uh, text, documents, records. Nevertheless, it wanted to have some, at the end of the day, some physical uh, evidence. So it said, well, can we not? Uh, we, the, the, the problem is that there is now a mount of rubble and there is a small uh, makeshift temple on top. Can we have some evidence nevertheless? So what it did was to, it commissioned a, a GPR study, that is to say ground penetrating radar study, uh, which was done by an Indo-Canadian firm and uh, uh, they did this study without uh, GPR is of course non-invasive so they, they didn't have to displace a single stone and they uh, from whatever access they could get to the location they tried to uh, read the underground structures and <coughs> this was submitted uh, as you can see to the Director General of uh, ASI which in turn submitted it to the High Court. And you see, uh, it's not very easy to, to read, but uh, because the, the evidence, actually they themselves accept that the evidence is confused, but they detect anomalies, sudden changes in the patterns which seem to indicate things like pillar bases or things like that. So they write in their report at the end that they detect many small discrete anomalies from 0.5 to 5.5 meters in depth that could be associated with ancient and contemporaneous structures such as pillars, foundation walls, slab flooring, extending over a large portion of the site. In other words, in plain English, they, there seems to be something. There seems to be something, but then they conclude very cautiously that uh, any excavation will be able to tell. So this is what Allahabad High Court finally decided. It ordered ASI to conduct an excavation which ASI did in 2002 and 3 and uh, this is one of the views of the excavation. It was done over a fairly uh, wide area which whatever could be reached without uh, disturbing the, the, the makeshift temple and uh, they <coughs> detected uh, uh, the existence of an ancient mound over one square kilometer 
with a cultural deposit of 10.8 meters. Now, this is important because even the very height of this deposit, cultural deposit means all the successive layers of human occupation in the course of time. So that there is such a height of deposit itself points to a, a very long occupation of the site. They divided it into nine periods. So the excavations, even while the excavations went on, lots of controversies were constantly generated, especially by the pro uh, Babri Masjid Action Committee historians. Uh, some were complaining that um, uh, those taking part in the excavations were predominantly Hindus and there should be equal number of Hindu and Muslim excavators, which was very funny because ASI never considers the religion of, you know, its uh, archaeologists. It's a bit like asking the Indian army if there is a war with Pakistan that we should have 50% uh, Hindu and 50% uh, Muslim Jawan, something of the sort. Anyway, after all this was settled down, uh, the report was submitted and these are the nine periods which you need not actually uh, take much note of because we are going to run through them. Um, but the, the interesting point is that we have really the entire uh, culture um, evolution in the Ganga Plains right from uh, northern black polished ware at the top uh, all the way to the late Mughal uh, period. So we'll, we'll go through that in, in greater detail. Let us start actually from period one which uh, unexpectedly was dated through very reliable methods. Uh, samples were sent abroad to, to very good labs. Uh, to get firm dates. And this northern black polished ware, which normally is uh, dated in the Ganges Valley to about 700 BC and not earlier, suddenly here jumped to 13th century BC. Uh, this has been since confirmed at other sites like uh, Rajgir uh, and a few more. So there is a bit of an unsettled controversy here, uh, but this concerns only archaeologists about the real date of the northern black polish ware. Whatever it may be, this first period of occupation, very first period, um, uh, throws up some artifacts like rough figurines, beads, but then in this particular location, no structural remains. I suppose that if we want to, uh, to trace structural remains going to that period, we would have to excavate closer to the river, down from the mound probably there could be a chance to find some, some remains of this uh, period. Anyhow, uh, so very little cultural remain. But then we move to the historical period, as it is called. So uh, that's uh, uh, second century BC, the conquest of Ayodhya by the Shungas, assisted by the Indo-Greeks, incidentally. During this period, ASI reports uh, um, uh, figurines of a mother goddess you have here uh, the image of it, uh, quite typical of Gangetic uh, figurines of that period, very typical. It's called, I think, the, the Mathura style of, uh, of uh, sculpture. Uh, human and animal figurine, beads, etc. Uh, and for the first time, a rudimentary rough stone and brick uh, structure which marks the beginning of the structural activity at the site. As I said, uh, there may have been structures earlier, but then the excavations were, of course, limited in extent. During the same period, something very interesting happens, which is the uh, find of at Koshambi, and Koshambi is actually, uh, you know, close to, uh, between Kampu and Allahabad, so very much in this region. Uh, second of the first century BC, there is a, uh, a very interesting terracotta figurine emerging uh, uh, from Koshambi, where you see here this figure uh, carrying this struggling lady. And you can see that she is dropping her ornaments to the ground. So this is very clearly the story of Ravana and Sita. This is the earliest artistic evidence we have uh, to confirm the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Ramayana story, basically. So this tells us that by this time, 1st or 2nd century BC, the Ramayana story is already uh, widespread and uh, people are already representing it in, in various art forms. So this is, of course, most important. 
Then, <coughs> period three now, uh, we have large brick structures uh, and rammed with a rammed floor, terracotta images of gods and goddesses. During this period, at Nashik, there is a cave inscription where a Shatavahana king actually praises his own father and compares him to Rama. He says, uh, among many other ideal kings. So, uh, so it shows that by this time, again, so very early, Rama is already, whether he is a mythical or historical person, doesn't matter, he is already taken as an ideal f uh, model for uh, kings to follow. So uh, this confirms that the Ramayana story is already widespread. Koshambi again, uh, 2nd century CE, there's an inscription on a stone slab which records some pious act in connection with Bhagavat Rama Narayana. And uh, this, uh, so whatever the, the uh, precise act is, it shows that uh, Rama is now worshipped. So we can clearly see that uh, by this period, 2nd century uh, CE or AD, the cult to Rama is already well established. So therefore, and, and here is a confirmation in the 3rd century CE, the same period 3 of the archaeologists. This comes from Haryana. And uh, what's interesting here is that the, the, the name of Rama is actually written explicitly in Brahmi letters. So there is no doubt. So this is uh, possibly one of the very first uh, statues, figurines, uh, de de depicting Rama himself. So uh, it's, it's quite clear that uh, the claim that uh, there is no cult to Rama before the 15th century, as uh, some historians actually, actually it was R.S. Sharma in this case, made, uh, is not valid. They have not looked at all this evidence. Um, mid second century also, actually a Greek geographer, the famous Ptolemy, who is also uh, an astronomer, mentions Ayodhya as Sagoda. It's obviously a, a distortion of Saketa. So it, it, that means the, the city is famous enough or important enough for the uh, Greek chroniclers when they depict the geography of North India to include it. Third century, uh, Nagarjuna Konda, which is a famous Buddhist site in Andhra Pradesh, uh, there is a stone panel depicting Bharata's meeting with Rama at Chitrakut. So you see, uh, once again, our borderlines between Buddhism, because it's a purely Buddhist site, and Hinduism are a little blurred, which is what we often see in ancient India. Uh, Haryana in fourth century, several inscribed terracotta panels depicting scenes from the Ramayana. And um, in this period, which is period four, um, uh, finds of various terracotta figurines at the site of Ayodhya. This, uh, this refers to the ASI excavations, but nothing more precise than this at this stage. Uh, the, during this uh, same period, the Chinese Buddhist pilgrim Fayen visits Ayodhya and mentions it. So uh, you see those pilgrims were attracted not by any Hindu site, but they wanted to visit the B Buddhist site. So that means that uh, Ayodhya was still important as a Buddhist site. Uh, 6th century, Varaha Mihra, totally different kind of evidence now. Uh, as I mentioned the other day, uh, Varaha Mihra was the author of Brihat Samhita, which was an uh, encyclopedia of basically all the knowledge available in his days. And uh, there are a couple of chapters on architecture and iconography. So iconography means, uh, uh, in fact, I, I was showing the other day a couple of slides where uh, those who are here will remember the various proportions to be given to a statue and dimensions. And here he says that for Sri Rama and Bali, uh, the, the statues should be 120 angulas high. This is the highest stature given for uh, the most important gods. And then for minor gods, there will be 108 angulas, still more minor gods, 96 angulas like this. So the importance, you know, the height of the statue is a function of the importance of the god. But this shows that by that time, uh, you know, Rama is worshipped as a major god. So it confirms the, the cult. 
Um, seventh century, Swan Song visits Ayodhya, which he calls Ayutu, and mentions the existence of 100 Buddhist monasteries with 3,000 monks. So this is quite a huge number. Uh, students of both Mahayana and Hinayana, you know, the two major schools of Buddhism, but also 10 Deva temples. By Deva temples, what he means is basically Hindu temples. So uh, uh, this is a, a further important testimony. And uh, now when we look at the, uh, we correlate with the evidence from Archaeological Survey of India, uh, in this period 7th to 10th century, which is period 5, now a, a structure appears at the site, which is this small uh, semicircular uh, shrine, which you can see here, about 1.5 meter by 1.5, and it has a small inner chamber. The, it's not a complete structure, part of it was demolished uh, or encroached upon later, but it has the various basic provisions of a, a, a small Hindu temples entrance from the east and a provision here called pranala for uh, pouring waters out, you know, for, to, for the waters poured inside to flow outside. It's a water chute. So uh, this is uh, uh, quite in consonance with other contemporary temples in the Ganga Yamuna region. So this is the first evidence that ASI has uh, come up with in terms of worship at the site of Ayur. But worship of what uh, at this stage cannot be said. Worship of which god, uh, only the structure is left. If we continue, we find now that the name of Rama <coughs> and his uh, cult, his worship, his fame, uh, spreads far and wide. Uh, there are plates in Tamil Nadu. Uh, this is uh, by a Pallava king who is said to have surpassed the glory of the Vela of Rama by his conquest of Lanka. So uh, you see that kings continue to compare themselves uh, to Rama. That is the standard set in front of them. Now, for the first time, Rama travels abroad. And we have in the 9th century at the Prambanam temple, you may remember I've shown this temple complex twice already, there is a stone panel depicting the subduing of the sea, you know, that episode before Rama is able to cross to Lanka. This is depicted in the 9th century in Prambanam temple. So this shows the, you see, we can now kind of plot the spread of this story and uh, this is possibly the first evidence outside India. In Kajurao, there is a giant temple at that same period uh, with two images because actually the giants claim uh, Rama as, as, as a giant king. Uh, they have their own version of uh, Ramayana where Rama uh, is uh, basically non-violent and um, uh, well it's, it's a whole different story. But they depict Rama holding the bow and arrow here and Rama with four arms holding the arrow. So for the Jains as well as for the Hindus, the, the bow and arrow are the symbol for Rama. 11th century, Angkor Wat temple, you may remember it from a previous talk. And here there are many stone panels depicting scenes from the Mahabharata and Ramayana. So the, the spread is, is almost complete. Now, of course, we enter a totally different phase in history because uh, the Islamic invasions occur across much of North India. The first attempt in this region is at um, 1033, where Salar Masood, the nephew of Mahmud of Ghazni, who had, uh, Mahmud of Ghazni, as you know, had invaded from Gujarat to Mathura, more or less. And uh, this nephew attacks Ayodhya uh, after begging to be allowed to carry the sword and Islam into the interior of Hindustan. But he was defeated and killed the next year. Um, then there is still, for some time, there are still Hindu kings uh, 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 in the region, in, in uh, controlling the region. And uh, one King Chandradeva of the Gadawala dynasty visits Ayodhya in uh, 1092 and records his visit in a plate. And he is said to have performed various rites, including the worship of God Vasudeva. So this shows us that by this time, 
there is worship of Rama going on at Ayodhya. This is possibly the first testimony of its kind. Uh, one of his successors, but I think perhaps his direct successor, Jaya Chandra, uh, builds a Vishnu temple according to an inscription found in the ruins of a mosque built close to the Ghats. Uh, there were lots of mosques in the course of time which were uh, built at Ayodhya, not only the Babri Masjid. And uh, one of them, uh, close to the Ghats, came up with several inscriptions. This is one of them. And finally, 1194, Ayodhya is taken by the Afghans. This is the time when much of the uh, Ganges uh, plains fall to the uh, invaders. This is also the time, for instance, when uh, Nalanda and uh, Vikramashila and other uh, important uh, Buddhist centers of learning uh, are destroyed at the same, uh, more or less within a few years. So during this period, <coughs> what ASI finds is that uh, there is a large structure which they cannot re readily identify, about 50 meters long, which is succeeded by a even more massive structure which has at least three phases, three successive floors and a huge pillared hole. So uh, here we, are, we, we have now a, a next totally different phase in the construction and uh, this pillared hole is uh, of course, very evocative. Uh, you can see here some of the pillar bases which have been uh, excavated. These are the pillar bases. And uh, they have counted, I think, s about 50. I thought it was 70. Anyway, uh, quite, a f quite a lot of them. And uh, therefore, it is, it is a big structure. Independently, quite independently of the ASI uh, evidence, there is a, a scholar called Bakker, I think his name is Bakker, who listed from uh, all inscriptions available the presence of five Vishnu temples in Ayodhya in the 12th century. So not one, but five. Uh, you can see that they are located near the Ghats, near uh, various Tirthas. And uh, final number five, of course, is a Vishnu temple on the Janmabhumi. So this is according to uh, Baker. Uh, the three of these have been replaced by mosques, and one was swept away by the Sarayu. So, in fact, uh, according to him, and uh, he, he's a contemporary scholar, he's, he wrote a big book on Ayodhya a few years ago, uh, there's no question about the existence of a Rama temple uh, there. Now, of course, uh, the, it is well known and well accepted because the evidence was photographed, as you can see here, uh, that in the old Babri Masjid, there were a number 12 to 14 pillars of Hindu temples. You can see one of them here which was photographed obviously before the demolition and um, they were bearing, all of them were bearing Hindu motifs and uh, uh, deities and they, they are easily datable because some of them had inscriptions in the Nagari script of the 12th century. You know the Nagari script um, evolved a lot in the course of time before it stabilized into what we call today Devanagari. There were many forms uh, in the course of time and region-wise also. So epigraphists are eas can easily date uh, a particular inscription by the, the, the form of this Nagari script. So uh, of course the, the scholars of the supporting the Babri Masjid Action Committee were confronted with such evidence uh, that you know there are there are 12 to 14 such pillars in the Babri Masjid, but then they kept using all kinds of you know negative arguments, saying that well it doesn't prove anything. They could have brought the pillars from uh, far away. They need not have belonged to this place, and uh, specious arguments of this kind, which uh, are quite absurd because there is no reason why. Uh, uh, a builder of a mosque should take the trouble of bringing Hindu pillars from a far distance. If the pillars were there, it means they were there before. And um, these are more photographs of the pillars inside the Babri Masjid. <coughs> and then 11, we can date this inscription 
uh, to the middle of the 12th century, I'm following the chronological uh, approach, uh, this inscription came to light after the uh, demolition uh, of the Babri Masjid in 1992. It is five foot long, it's a huge inscription, and it refers uh, it was carried out by some, uh, carried away by some of the Karsevaks and then immediately photographed. Uh, but then it was promptly put under lock and key uh, and it has not, to my knowledge, not been uh, made available uh, to the scholars. Uh, in fact, uh, the reason is that this inscription refers to a particular king, Govinda Chandra, and we know the dates of his rule, as you can see, uh, in, towards the middle of the 12th century, and he refers to a beautiful temple of Vishnu Hari. It's interesting that they actually do not always use the word Rama. We saw previously Vasudeva, now it is Vishnu Hari, but then he is also the killer of the ten-headed demon. So therefore we know that it is Rama, because ten-headed demon is Ravana. Uh, this is in Nagari script and uh, this inscription was deciphered independently by two great epigraphists, uh, Ajemitra Shastri and K.V. Ramesh. Uh, in fact, I was lucky personally to know, to, to know and meet both of them. Uh, they've both passed away. And uh, they spent a long time uh, uh, reading the inscription. Some uh, parts of it have been, you know, uh, polished by uh, the passage of time and uh, are almost erased like this. Uh, what uh, the response was uh, from the Babri Masjid Action Committee scholars, quite expectedly it was to say that it was a fake and that it had been planted at the spot. Now this is typically the kind of question which if there was an objective debate and objective research could be extremely easily settled because first of all we have two uh, great epigraphists, uh, uh, nobody can dispute their work, certifying that this is written in the Nagari, precise Nagari script of those times. And therefore, a, a faker would have to be very familiar with that script, first of all. Secondly, I believe that it would be possible by mineralogists and other material science scientists to, you know, uh, uh, do some measurements on these eroded uh, sections and actually come up with the uh, possible date for the erosion to have taken place. So if there was a real desire to know the age of this inscription, I think all that needs to be done is to hand over the, the stone slab to various uh, labs and get uh, uh, the, the, the scientific verdict and I'm sure it would confirm the date uh, of this king. In any case, epigraphically speaking, it is only some top epigraphist that could himself have created such a thing. So uh, this is most unlikely. Now we jump a little bit in time. There is a blank between the 13th and 15th century. Uh, then we, nothing much is known about what happens. Uh, or, or there are no records. Uh, the, the first record that follows is about Guru Nanak, unexpectedly. Uh, according, there are many biographical accounts, they are called Janam Shakhi, of Guru Nanaks, and uh, several of them refer to his visit to Ayodhya, about 1500. And he is recorded as, um, as, as telling his disciple uh, Mardana, who interestingly was actually originally a Muslim. Uh, but it, he was the first disciple of Guru Nanak. And he, he tells Mahana, this Ayodhya city belongs to Sri Ramachandraji, therefore let us have its darshana. And again, after bathing in the Sarayu, he gazed at Rama for darshana and then left overjoyed and earning his merit. So this simply shows that uh, there is still possibly a temple, because otherwise how could he have the darshan uh, in 1500? This needs in any case to be taken into account and uh, we can see also interestingly Guru Nanak worshipping Rama. Now when we come to the Babri Masjid itself, <coughs> there is some direct evidence available from the Masjid. Uh, that luckily is not in dispute. So 1528 
the, by the uh, one inscription reads, by order of King Babur, whose justice is an edifice meeting the palace and the sky, this descending place of angels, that is to say the mosque, was built by the fortune-favored noble Mir Baki. Mir Baki was a general of uh, Babur, and uh, he's the one, I mean, who uh, uh, conducted a campaign at Ayodhya. So this is what the inscription records. Uh, unfortunately, Babar himself did visit Ayodhya, and he left uh, his memoirs, you know, Babar Nama, uh, long uh, autobiographical records of his various campaigns in and out of India. Uh, but um, unfortunately, the portion related to uh, his visit to Ayodhya is missing. It has never been found in any of the manuscripts. So um, uh, we, can, we do not have direct testimony from, uh, from that end. But he camped there for a short period. Uh, one historian, Arnott, Professor Arnott, uh, formerly from Jaipur University, and an expert on Mughal architecture and Mughal art, uh, thinks that uh, Mir Baki did not possibly stay long enough to build the mosque, the Babri Masjid mosque, and perhaps it was actually a renovation from an earlier mosque. So the question remains open. But what the archaeologists have found, and that is quite firm, is that the mosque is built precisely over the walls of the former temple. There is no there are no independent foundations. It is using the, found, the foundations of the pre-existing temple. The, the size and texture of the bricks are the same as those of the bricks in the temple. And uh, the tem pillars of the temples were reused. That is why we find those pillars uh, in the Babri Masjid. Uh, in fact, this is not a new story. And uh, there is nothing really surprising to an objective historian. Uh, it's very hard to understand why there was such a huge attempt at denying the obvious. Uh, I showed, I think on Tuesday, the, the sketch done by James Princep at the uh, Vishwana temple, the old Vishwana temple at Varanasi, which was uh, demolished and uh, uh, overbuilt by a mosque. And this can be documented in many parts of India. For example, this lovely corridor of pillars which you see here, uh, you might try to attribute it to some Hindu temple, but it is actually a mosque. It is the mosque of the Qutub Minar complex uh, in Delhi, where the builder of the mosque, Qutub Uddin Aibak, boasts actually in an inscription, the inscription is there, and it has been published in many records, that he constructed this mosque with the pillars and remains of 27 uh, Hindu and Jain temples which he demolished. So, you know, there was absolutely no concealment on the part of the uh, uh, Muslim uh, rulers, military campaigners and so on, because they considered that it was part of their duty to eradicate um, uh, uh, idolatry, as they called it. So it's difficult to understand why there was so much of uh, uh, controversy about uh, Ayodhya. Now, one argument used by the uh, Babri Masjid Action Committee scholars was that Tulsidas, in his version of the Ramayana, you know that he wrote, of course, he composed a Hindi uh, Ramayana. Um, Tulsidas is completely silent over the, and he lived in the, in the 16th century, about the demolition and so on. Um, but then the point is, why should in, in Ramayana, in his Ramayana, why should he jump in time and come to his period? You see, he narrates the story of Rama, not his own story. However, there is a lesser known work of Tulsi Das called Tulsi Doha Shatak, uh, where he does compose a few verses uh, narrating the destruction of uh, Ayodhya. And he gives the date according to the Samwat era, which corresponds exactly to the construction of the Babri Masjid. It fits perfectly with the inscription in the Babri Masjid. And he says, Tulsidas says, he speaks in the third person, that uh, in that year, something, sometime around the summer season, the ignorant Yavanas he calls them Yavanas. Yavana is an old 
word which was used for uh, initially for the Greeks, uh, later on for the Romans, and basically for uh, any invader from the West. So. Uh, the Yavanas caused disaster and sorrow in Awad. Destroying the temple at Rama Janmabhumi, they constructed a mosque. At once, <coughs> they killed many Hindus. And, uh, well, Tulsidas laments about it. So there is a testimony, actually, from Tulsidas. Um, then we have a lot of very interesting documents, uh, both from Islamic and uh, soon British sources. For example, uh, Abu al-Fazl, who is one of the two biographers of Akbar, records in his biography of Akbar, he says, Ayodhya, commonly called Awad, the distance of 40 kors, it's a unit of length, to the east and 20 to the north is regarded as sacred ground. Awad is one of the largest cities of India, and it is esteemed one of the holiest places of antiquity. It was the residence of Ramachandra, who in the Treta age combined in his own person both the spiritual supremacy and kingly office. So you see that the association between, the, between Ayodhya and uh, the, the holiness of Ayodhya and Rama <coughs> is, is quite accepted uh, by this time, even uh, by this Muslim scholar. And in fact, Agbar, to, uh, to celebrate the story of the Ramayana, had several coins, you see here one of them, depicting Rama and Sita. You see, and, and this legend in Arabic script mentions this. So, of course, this is quite in consonance with his broad outlook and personal interest in Hinduism also. The earliest testimony from a uh, Western European, rather, traveler comes from the 17th century, one Finch visited Ayodhya and uh, he finds it all in ruins. He writes, a city of ancient note, seat of a potent king, now much ruined. The castle built 400 years ago. Here are also the ruins of, you have to understand, Ramachandra's castle and houses, which the Indians acknowledge for the great god. In these ruins remain certain Brahmins. Hither resort many from all parts of India. Now this is very important for a simple reason that this is the time when the mosque is already in existence, and yet this traveler tells us that uh, there are Brahmins there worshipping Rama, and people, pilgrims, come from all parts of India. In other words, this place remained a place of pilgrimage for Hindus, despite the destruction of the temple and the construction of a mosque. The castle is actually Ram Court. Uh, it is uh, uh, identified with Ramcourt, that is to say, the fort of Rama. I will show you the map of it uh, in a later slide. Uh, then, late 17th century, we have Aurangzeb's chief secretary, uh, so that's quite an official testimony, saying, as this city was the residence of King Ramchand, it is held to be one of the holiest places. So, in other words, the, the, the Muslims basically accept the Hindu tradition. Though, of course, they want to destroy it, that's, that's their uh, mission, but they, they, they accept the basic fact that Rama is worshipped there. In fact, Aurangzeb's granddaughter writes in 1707, keeping the triumph of Islam in view, devout Muslim rulers should keep all idolaters in subjection to Islam, broke no laxity in realization of jizya. This was the tax that the infidels had to pay and keep in constant use for Friday and congressional prayer the mosques built up to strengthen Islam after demolishing the temples of the idolatrous Hindus situated at Mathura, Banaras and Awad, etc., which the wretched infidels have, according to their faith, judged to be the birthplace of Kanheya in one case, Sita Rasoi in another. Now, Sita Rasoi, the kitchen of Sita, we will see later, is, is another name for the uh, uh, Rama complex at Ayodhya. And Hanuman's abode in a third, and claimed that after the conquest of Lanka, Ramachandra established him there. 
And as has been stressed, idol worship must not continue publicly, nor must the sound of bell reach Muslim ears. So this is interesting because she, this granddaughter of Aurangzeb, uh, confirms uh, the the uh, the demolition of the of the temple at Ayodhya, among others. Then, 18th century, we have a, dec a document signed by a high official, the Qazi of Faizabad, who mentions that a serious riot took place between Hindus and Muslims over the masjid built by the Emperor of Delhi. So, this is important because it shows that uh, 18th century Hindus and Muslims are fighting over the control of the place. So, Hindus find this place important enough, in other words, to be prepared to fight over it. Um, one Nawab, actually, in the same period, uh, who is in control of Ayodhya, invites Maratha help against impending Afghan invasion. And the Maratha leader agrees, no, excuse me, the Nawab agrees to transfer, this is a kind of a concession he makes to secure Maratha assistance, uh, he agrees to transfer the holy cities of Ayodhya and Kashi to the Maratha leader, uh, who was uh, Ragoba, but uh, the Maratha army gets entangled in elsewhere in Punjab, so this does not happen. But it shows that as a concession, this was the kind of gesture that Enawa was prepared to make to secure um, uh, Hindu support. We have a very important testimony a little later in the 18th century by an Austrian uh, uh, Jesuit, his name is Joseph Tiefenthaler, and uh, <clears throat> this testimony is quoted in the, like many of these documents in fact, in the judgment of the Allahabad High Court, uh, but it was originally written in German, translated in French in the 18th century, and then translated from French into English for the court, but the translation is poor, so I have done it afresh. And um, it reads, a word called Ayodhya, of course it's uh, wrong uh, spelling, by well-read Hindus, is a city of the remotest antiquity. Uh, please note that this Jesuit father was actually very hostile to Hinduism. He regarded uh, Hinduism as nothing but superstition and he came to, to, to you know, convert people to Christianity. That was his mission. Today this city is not much populated. There was here a temple constructed on the river's high bank, but Aurangzeb, always mindful of spreading the sect of Mahomet and abhorring the Gentiles, Gentiles is a contemptuous term for Hindus, got it demolished and replaced by a mosque fronted by two obelisks in order to abolish the very memory of the Hindu superstition. There's a confusion here, you will see, between Aurangzeb and <coughs> Uh, Babur. One particular famous place is the one called Sitara Soy, that is to say the table of Sita, wife of Ram. Uh, this place adjoins the city on the southern side and is situated on a hillock. Emperor Aurangzeb had the fortress called Ram Court demolished. At the same place he constructed a Mahometan temple with three domes, that is the Babri Masjid. Others say that it was constructed by Babur. So that is, of course, is the correct version. Fourteen pillars of black stone can be seen in it, pointed to the location of the former fortress. Um, Aurangzeb, or according to others, Babur, got this place raised in order to deprive the Gentiles of the opportunity to practice their superstitions. Nevertheless, they continue to offer a superstitious cult at both places, namely, at a house where Rama was born by doing three circumlations while prostrated on the ground. So what this tells us basically here is that Hindus are stubbornly continuing to worship at the place. There, has, there have been riots, we don't really know what they are fighting for uh, control of the uh, Here you can see on the 20, uh, 24th of the month of Chaitra, a big congregation of people celebrate here the birth of Ram, so famed in the whole of India. This is Ram Navami. So it shows that people are coming from various parts of India for th this event. Uh, there's uh, quite a uh, number of very interesting events in the 19th century. I've selected a few. There is actually a jihad, according to the Islamic records, in 1855 for the recapture of Hanuman Gadi. 
This is a, 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 a holy site very close to the um, uh, to the uh, Babri Masjid. And uh, there was a temple to Hanuman once upon a time. It was associated to, actually you have the, uh, you have the uh, temple to Rama succeeded by the Babri Masjid. Then there is the uh, Sita Ki Rasoi and there is Hanuman Gadi. All three spots were highly holy to the Hindus. And one Muslim chronicler st states, and for ultimately, on this date, July 1855, uh, for the 10th or 12th time, nearly two or 300 Muslims gathered at Babri Masjid, which is situated inside the Sita Ki Rasoi. Uh, in short, the turbulence reached such a stage that apart from the mit mitigated mosque at Hanuman Gari, the Hindus built a temple in the courtyard of Babri Masjid where Sita Ki Rasoi was situated. So what's here, the, the account is a little uh, confused in part, but what's very important here is that Hindus have managed to uh, re-establish worship in the courtyard of the Babri Masjid, and this is confirmed by other documents. In fact, I forgot to point out, yeah, Yes, he accepts the terminology of, uh, of Sitaki Rasoi. Um, then British documents begin, and they are very important, uh, because they give us a, a, a fairly objective light. They have no side to take, you see, in this issue. They just note the facts as they see them. And there is one Carnegie who contributed to several gazetteers of this region, gazetteers of Oud, which are very precious uh, documents on the geography, population, and history of the region. And he says, the Mohammedans on that occasion actually charged up the steps of the Hanuman Gari, but were driven back with considerable loss. The Hindus then followed up this success, and at the third attempt, took the Janmashtam, at the gate of which 75 Mohammedans are buried in the martyr's grave. 11 Hindus were killed. It is said that up to that time, the Hindus and Mohammedans alike used to worship in the mosque temple. See, he calls it mosque temple. Since British rule, a railing has been put up to prevent disputes within which in the mosque, the Mohammedans pray, while outside the fence, the Hindus have raised a platform on which they make their offerings. In other words, uh, uh, Hindu worship has been kind of accepted within a limited area in, in uh, very close to the Babri Masjid. This is actually the same Carnegie making a map of, you can read perhaps Ram Court uh, with uh, part, uh, this is the entire complex here uh, where uh, several places of worship at the top of them, of course, the Babri Masjid uh, are located. <coughs> Uh, one participant <coughs> in the uh, say uh, this, this jihad writes that uh, even as the Muslim rulers cleared up Mathura, Banaras, etc., from the dust and dross of infidelity, they cleared up Faizabad and Awad also from the filth of false belief, in as much as it is a great place of worship and was the capital of Rama's father. Here they broke the temples and left no stone-hearted idol intact. Where there was a big temple, they got, there they got a big, big mosque constructed, and when there was a small pavilion, there they erected a plain camp mosque or enclosure. Accordingly, what a majestic mosque Babur Shah has got constructed in 1526 CE. It is still known far and wide as the Sita Kira Soi Mosque. Now, this is very amusing <laughs> because <coughs> it is not Babri Masjid Mosque, it is the Sita Kira Soi Mosque. And this is from a, a, a Muslim writer. So, you can see in any case that uh, they, 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 on the Muslim side, uh, they have absolutely no difficulty in acknowledging, proudly, in fact, that there was a temple and we demolished it to, to install uh, this mosque. So it is difficult to understand the, the objections to this. F 56 now, Awad is annexed by the British and that's the end of the Nawabi rule. And two years later, <coughs> there is of course the so-called mutiny happening in, in between. Uh, mutiny is the 
the, uh, the first uh, great rebellion. Um, then 80, 50, 1858, a petition by the uh, Katib and uh, Muhammad of the Masjid against the Hindus' continued worship in the Janmasthan Mosque. So now we have a new terminology. We have Sita Ki Rasoi Mosque and we have the Janmasthan Mosque. Mentions that the Janmasthan area has been lying unkept and in disorder for hundreds of years and that the Hindus have carried on worship there. So this is a, a, again a confirmation of what we have seen so far. 1871, Alexander Cunningham, whom we met a few times in previous talks, he was the founder of the Archaeological Survey of India, and he crisscrossed the whole of North India trying to correlate modern sites with ancient uh, cities mentioned in the Chinese pilgrims accounts, in the Greek accounts, uh, and he published a monumental uh, geography of ancient India. So when it comes to this part, he says the whole place wears a, a look of decay. There is only a low irregular mass of rubbish heaps from which all the bricks have been excavated for the houses of the neighboring city of Faizabad. The two cities together occupy an area of nearly six square miles or just about one half of the probable size <coughs> of the ancient capital of Rama. And Carnegie in 77 writes, Ayodhya must have at least possessed a fine temple in the Janmashtan, for many of its columns are still in existence, these are the pillars we have seen earlier, and in good preservation, having been used by the Muslims in the construction of the Babri Mosque. This is by Carnegie. Then we have, uh, very interestingly, a petition by a Mahant, Mahant Raghubir Das, in 1886, who wants to build a temple uh, right outside the Babri Masjid. And uh, he says that uh, Hindus have been worshipping here for centuries, so let us have a temple. The judge, one Colonel uh, Chemia, district judge of Faizabad, gives a judgment after visiting the site personally for inspection. In those days, judges would move about, you know, for their own, uh, today they don't, uh, they remain in their courts. But anyway, he says, it is most unfortunate that a masjid should have been built on land speci specially held sacred by the Hindus, but as that event occurred 356 years ago, it is too late now to remedy the grievance. But you see that the fact is universally accepted by Hindus, by Muslims, and by the British. In fact, uh, a well-known archaeologist, Furar, uh, who was in the employ of Archaeological Survey of India, writes in 1889, Babur's Majjid at Ayodhya was built in um, 1523 by Mir Khan on the very spot where the old temple, Janmashtanam of Ramachandra, was standing. So you can see that uh, there is a universal agreement. And finally, <coughs> The question of historicity, because I think I have answered the first uh, questions, whether there was uh, a temple pre-existing the mosque, whether the temple was destroyed to uh, give way to the mosque. In fact, this is what, uh, uh, on, the on the theme of the destruction, we have to depend almost exclusively, with the exception of Tulsidas, we have to depend almost exclusively on Islamic sources. It is the Islamic sources that tell us that the temple was destroyed for the mosque to be built. It is not Hindu sources. Hindu sources are only telling us about the worship uh, uh, to, to Rama and the great importance, religious importance of this place. As far as the historicity is concerned, this is what one British official wrote in 1877 in one of those gazetteers. He writes, whether criticism will finally enroll the hero, that is Rama, among the highest creations of pure imagination, <coughs> or accord him a semi-historical personality and a doubtful date, it is barren to speculate. History is more nearly concerned with the influence which the story of his life still has on the moral and religious beliefs of a great people and the enthusiasm which makes his birthplace the most highly venerated of the sacred places 
to which its pilgrims crowd. So what this uh, Mr. Bennett is telling us is that it doesn't make any difference uh, whether Rama was a hysterical person or not, and that is the whole point. The point is that uh, we are not concerned here with the historicity of Rama, but simply with the historicity of his cult, of how long he has been revered in India, <clears throat> and we can date uh, dating of, on the archaeological evidence, the evidence from the depictions of Ravana, Rama, which we saw, we can date this all the way to the first centuries BC. And uh, the sp rapid spread of its cult in the first centuries AD. So, in fact, uh, nothing much remains from the objections of the Babri Masjid uh, um, uh, Action Committee historians and uh, the Fury, the Allahabad. High Court judgment, those of you who are interested, you will see that <coughs> the judges have personally interviewed the historians who uh, defended the Babri Masjid Action Committee and they put probing questions to them and one after the other, all those scholars accepted that they had never studied this, the history of Ayodhya, they were, had no competence in medieval history of India, they had not seen the Islamic documents, they had basically not seen any of these of the sources, some of which I have presented here. So this is a controversy which is purely based on ideology <coughs> and not on a sober <coughs> examination of the facts available to us. Facts available to us not from one but from many different sources and all of them broadly in agreement. Of course there remains detailed, details, important details to be settled. What happened if the mosque was built in uh, 1528 uh, and there was a big temple in the 12th century what exactly happened in between there is of course a period where we can you know build up several possible scenarios but the broad scenario is clear enough and it was accepted universally until uh, the 19th century which is where why I have stopped uh, at uh, this date because once we enter the 20th century then things get much murkier and uh, this uh, a whole controversy is uh, created, in fact, quite unnecessarily. I would like to close by mentioning that it is not as if <coughs> uh, uh, there were no Muslims uh, willing to uh, uh, actually reconcile with Hindus. There were several Muslim groups in this region at different points of time since the beginning of the controversy, I mean the, the re- uh, resurrection of the controversy in the 1990s, several Muslim groups, you know, said if this place is so important for Hindus, let us give it to them. The, actually, the Babri Masjid Mosque in the 1930s had been locked and abandoned by Muslims themselves. The, the keeper moved to Varanasi and for decades together, the mosque was just lying empty. It has never been uh, a place of great religious importance to the Muslims. So some Muslim groups did say that, you know, we should, as a gesture of goodwill, let us hand over the place to, to the Hindus and be done with it. Uh, but the, this Babri Masjid Action Committee took a very, uh, uh, you know, hard line uh, that uh, under no circumstances should it be uh, handed over to the Hindus. So um, uh, this, is, this is why the whole problem happens. And even recently, after the judgment of the Allahabad High Court, I was pleased to note uh, in the newspapers, but unfortunately this is kind of news that you can just, you know, you have just one small paragraph and then you don't really know what happens if you don't live in the region. There was a group of Muslims, in fact young Muslims, the article said, uh, who had started after the judgment of the uh, Allahabad High Court, which as you know, divided the plot broadly into three portions. Uh, and uh, the Hindus were to get the portion where the, uh, the, the, the temple, the makeshift temple is now located. Uh, and this group of Muslims from this region said that we will now collect money to uh, hand over to the Hindus for the construction of the permanent Hindu temple. So you can see that uh, it is not as if uh, we should not oversimplify the issue and consider that all Muslims want the Babri Masjid back. Uh, uh, of course, we could also say probably the other way around that uh, it is not as if all Hindus want the Rama temple at any cost. Uh, but uh, there has been uh, there have been other Muslim voices, and unfortunately, they have not been heard enough. Otherwise, perhaps this whole controversy 
uh, might have, you know, um, disappeared some time back. Thank you.